everybody and welcome back to another episode of Rapping with Reefum. I'm your host Keith Berkelhammer. So on today's show I'm very excited to welcome John Coppolino or Cops as he's known on the uh, Reef Discussion Forums. What's up there John? How you doing man? What's going on Keith? Thanks for having me and thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, yeah it's great. I've been watching some of your videos today and uh, yeah in addition to being a, an accomplished reefer you're Doing a good service there, so. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, we uh, we kind of scrambled. We had a little technical difficulty, and I think yep. I think we were like one minute late. <laughs> so, uh, right. I think it was a problem on my end in terms of uh, the audio. But if any, if anybody out there is um, not hearing us terribly well, then please let us know in the chat. But I think we're good on that front. So let me let me just give a little background on John. For those of you that don't know uh, John, and John's been a reef tank hobbyist for close to 30 years. Is that true, John? Uh, yeah. Geez, over 30 years now. Over yes. 30 years. I'm, yes. I'm pushing yeah. 30 years, but um, I don't know exactly <laughs> what it is for myself, but yeah, wow. Yeah, 1989, technically. Wow. Yes. Cool. Yep. So John lives in northern Virginia and keeps about 2,500 gallons of saltwater aquariums, most being reefs. I guess you've got a big uh, saltwater aquarium, right? Yeah, so the uh, yeah, I had a 350 gallon fish only uh, that I have built in last year. I swapped that over to that is now a freshwater discus tank um, planted. Um, yeah, I haven't kept freshwater in, you know, 20 something years. Uh, got back into that during COVID. So, yeah. Wow. So, uh, all right. So in addition to publishing articles and speaking at conferences, including three past magnas, John has spoken to reef clubs in over 20 states. His systems have been featured in publications in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. These include the book The Coral Reef Aquarium by Tony Vargas. John is also just one of two people to have received the prestigious Reef Central Tank of the Month for two different systems, September of uh, 04 and January of 11th. I think I might be the other uh, person there, John, or maybe there's three of us yeah, out so there. Yeah, so I think that, informa that, uh, maybe, yeah, that information you got might be uh, uh, a little bit dated right now. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm just a crazy hobbyist, um, don't really work in the industry. Um, yeah, but uh, I appreciate the introduction. Thanks, Keith. Well, I, I, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> so in the summer of 2013, John started building his largest system yet, the 1,300-gallon SPS display that we're going to talk a lot about tonight, and a 240-gallon anemone display, and two six-foot frag tanks that are installed in the forever home that he and his wife built. 
John also has had a um, has a number of SPS named after him. I've got a couple of those in my uh, tanks. They're uh, they're beautiful uh, SPS. He is the real deal, folks. So please take advantage of the time we have with John and ask him questions during the uh, during the live stream in the chat. I see we have a few uh, folks that uh, familiar faces or, or uh, uh, YouTubers out there. Star City Reef, welcome Blue Reef, Johnny Wade Riles, Mike Johnson, John Reef of Vermont. What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in, and I, I appreciate the uh, continued support there. So, so John, how did this all begin? One, one thing I want to apologize in advance. I'm actually in San Diego right now in a hotel room, um, so I apologize for the boring background. Uh, Keith and I got on early. I had, you know, the Coronado Bridge in the background, but my face was, you know, dark and all that, so I'm just sitting, uh, sitting in front of a desk here, uh, kicking it in San Diego. So my apologies for not having any aquariums in the background. I guess, you know, it would have been kind of cool to see some palm trees and, and just the dark figure in front of them but uh, i don't know man we want, we want to see your uh, we want to see their face there so yeah. um yeah uh kevin chu is uh, asking does cops still have the 65 to 70 gallon tank uh so the it depends which 65 yeah so if you go to if you just google cops uh totem t-o-t-m um 2004 uh, that was a 65 gallon uh, that I had set up. I don't know if we're going to go through some photos there, but uh, I do not have that tank. That was two houses ago in the apartment, um, but you could see plenty of photos from that. And uh, I don't have that tank anymore. No, that moved on. <laughs> well, it's 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 incredible, like kind of like where you think about where you're starting this hobby and now where you're you're currently at. It's, I guess you've kind of come a long way, huh? Yeah, I mean, I'm just really uh, just like so many of us. I've had a passion since I was a kid, um, and I've just taken it to a maddening level. Uh, you know, this this system I created. You know, I, I stand up there often on top of it, and I just look at it, and I'm like, you know, what has my passion done to me? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure we all get to that point. There's always that that saying I love that you know the only relaxing reef tanks are other people's. Um, and all that, but, but this, uh, you know, the, the current system I have now was pretty much, you know, uh, over 20 years of brainstorming in my head of what I wanted when I was in a house that, you know, that I wasn't going to be moving from in any near, uh, near term, but, you know, we all know moving sucks, uh, period, especially for a reefer. So I settled in, we built our forever home and I built my forever system, which we can go through. So, um, really that's, that's all it is. A lot of people that, you know, I mean, I've given talks and, you know, but I work outside of the industry. I'm really just a, just a crazy guy with a passion as, uh, as many of us are. Yeah. So you're not daydreaming about another tank down the road at this point. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, no, there is no way. This is the, you know, uh, I, I put so much planning into this tank. It was exactly what I wanted. No bigger, no smaller. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, as soon as I got to that point, you know, we had all from when we were kids, we'd have our, up, you know, our dream systems, what we would do, you know, I got to that point. And even since I set it up, um, you know, that sort of evolved with what I wanted in there and everything like that. So, yeah. So you got DC reefer, eight hey, cops, uh, Wham hey. Whamus? Is that how you, Whamus? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm a house. member of uh, Whamus. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in North Jersey, uh, but I've been in the D.C. area now for uh, since basically I lived in South America for a couple of years. I've been in D.C. now uh, or right in Northern Virginia, right outside D.C. That's the Washington Area Marine Aquarius Society. I've been the speaker coordinator there for um, for years. Uh, we're, we might be the largest marine aquarium club in the nation. We're always talking about that when we're at MACNA. We have, uh, you know, I think it was something over 750 paid members. Wow. Uh, I haven't checked in on that lately, but um, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we have a great group of people that do the the not fun work in the club. You know, I I, I bring my friends in, you know, as speakers and you know put them up and hang out with them all weekend. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a pretty fluff job, um, you know, I have for the club, but there's uh, any good club, as we all know, has, you know, good people behind it that do a lot of the not fun stuff that it takes to run a club. But yeah. Well, clubs are really, really important. I mean, that is a, uh, it's a great thing to have to be able to be a part of a club because you're, um, you know, the camaraderie and, and just to be able to kind of share that knowledge amongst, uh, you know, hobbyists and to just do some old fashioned trading in terms of frags, yep. you know, I mean, that stuff, I think, um, perhaps, you know, we've gotten away from that a little bit with, with today's online world. It's very easy to kind of, um, 
forget about what you've got locally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love it. Um, you know, I, I love just getting together with people. I love going to Magna every year. I've actually spoken at four Magnas now. Um, and then, you know, uh, I love going to them. You meet up with, you know, it's not only meeting with your friends or, you know, as reef hobbyists, we know that, you know, our friends outside of the hobby, you know, you try and explain what's going on, especially with an operation like I have in my house. And you almost feel like you're speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, uh, but then, you know, so it's good to have your friends that have done it before. And on the level I did it, uh, a lot of the friends I looked up to were public aquarium figures. Um, you know, with all of my my local friends, my, you know, my my home hobbyist friends, I was a nut job. But the way I sort of balance that out was, you know, I looked to my public aquarium friends and, you know, I was setting up a 2000 gallon system with a 1300 gallon display, you know, 6000 watts of light. That's that's nothing. That's nothing compared to what, you know, guys like Bruce Carlson, Charles Delbake, you know, I mean, there's a long list of uh, public aquarium friends that I leaned hard on when I planned all of this. Uh, you know, without them, this would not have become uh, a realization at all. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's incredible in terms of just, uh, you know, looking at your uh, your system and and, uh, we're, and we're going to go into detail in terms of how you uh, set all that up. But it just looks like a mini public aquarium that you've um, built. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, I'm just surprised more home reefers haven't done it. You go to a public aquarium and, you know, when I go, I know people. So, I you know, I go behind the scenes and you see this area where people can just have projects, get the floor wet, you know, not worry about getting carpet wet or anything like that. Do all the things we love to do. But then at the same time, you go to the public space and it's quiet. You don't hear gurgling pumps. You don't see, you know, you don't see return pumps. You don't see anything. You know, I use Kydex on my aquariums, which is common in public aquariums. You almost don't see it in homes. Um, you know, and you'll see a lot of home reef tanks and you look at them, you know, but you'll see pumps here, you'll hear gurgling and, and, you know, so as I, I sort of, you know, built the main level of my house where my aquariums are, uh, like a public aquarium so that I can go behind the scenes, get water on the floor. I epoxy coated the floors. Um, and then at the same time, I could shut the doors to all of that. If my wife and I were hosting people, it's relaxing, you know, they can look at the tanks and they, you know, and it's just more relaxing that way. And it's, you know, um, I don't know, it's, you know, my wife, we, we just celebrated 20 years of marriage. We met, you know, when we were 20 years old and she's put up with, you know, uh, God knows what, <laughs> everything through the years. So that's sort of also, you know, a token to, you know, um, you know, she never really goes back in my fish rooms and cares about if I have salt boxes yeah. here, you know, I keep things organized, but uh, yeah, so I, I was inspired a lot by public aquariums uh, in that respect. So what, yeah. one more question uh, for you before we dig in. Who uh, who inspired you in terms of reef keepers? You know, when you got into the hobby, you know, who did you kind of like look up to? Who did you think about in terms of uh, who did you want to oh, emulate? So so I I I grew up in North Jersey um, and. I grew up on an island on a lake, on Upper Greenwood Lake, New Jersey, way up in northern Jersey, uh, three miles from New York State. You know, it was basically forest land. It was only an hour outside of New York City. We'd go into the city every weekend in Brooklyn. Um, and I just always had a passion. We went to a carnival when I was really young. We won three goldfish. Uh, one of them lived for seven. One of them lived for eight years. And I was we did everything you know, really, I've had a water life. Uh, ice hockey and fish were my true passions growing up. But we, you know, we water skied, I would go fishing, everything related to the lake, it would freeze over in the winter. Um, and I would just, you know, I started keeping fish from the lake in aquariums, I got, you know, when I'm seven years old, I got a hexagon tank in the kitchen, that was my first true tropical tank. And then when I was 11, I convinced my parents finally to let me go salt mm -hmm. with the old standard four foot, 55 gallon, 13 inches wide. Uh, that was in yeah, 1989. And then I was in middle school then. And then by high school, as soon as I got my working papers, um, I got a job slinging fish. It was a place called uh, the Pet Place yeah. in uh, Wayne, New Jersey. Um, or pet play. This is not the one in, um, yeah, there's, uh, uh, not the one in Lancaster. This was in North Jersey. They had 300 fish tanks. Um, 
I mean, loads of salt water. And, you know, it was uh, my mother would drop me off there and another place called Rainbow Aquarium, literally go do her shopping. I was a kid. I would just hang out with the guy. As soon as I got my working papers, I got a job there. Um, and so that was very inspirational. Another place, it was further uh, in Clifton, New Jersey. It was called Aquatropics. Now uh, it goes by the name Absolutely yeah, Fish. Yeah, I know that place. It's still open. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the fantastic... Uh, and they're becoming rarer and rarer uh, local fish stores that are just inspirational. And to a lot of us in sort of my generation of when we got in the hobby, we were inspired by places like this, you know, and they're fewer and fewer, unfortunately. Um, but there were a lot of guys that I met in Aquatropics just as a kid. I remember going in there, you know, the Red Sea invasion. They had seven hundred and fifty dollar ask for angels mm. purple tanks coming in you know they were four or five hundred bucks you know and then the flip side of that um clarion angels oh, yeah. you know their holy yeah. grails they were two hundred dollars you know they were regularly being imported all these things but um yeah i mean a lot of uh you know greg scheimer um steve weist's yeah. tanks um for those of you that has seen uh, he was oregon reef back in the day um and he you know, had he was one of the few guys that set up a system that looked like a public aquarium, was large, was aesthetically very pleasing. Um, and a lot of people sort of in this hobby, there's a there's sort of an aesthetic part to it. And then there's the technical side to it. And really, I think the best reefers will meld both of those together. You know, there's a lot of people that are technically good. They can keep corals healthy, all that but you look at their tanks and you're like, really, that's the aqua, you know, I mean, um, you know, then there's other people that could create a beautiful aquascape, but they just can't keep it alive. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we all know this is, you know, even for, it doesn't matter who you are in the world, this hobby is always a challenge and there's always, always something. Th yeah. That's the phrase you hear a lot. It's always something. <laughs> it always is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's, that's what makes the highs high in this hobby. You know, without lows like that, if it were that easy, everybody would do it and everybody would have, you know, beautiful reef aquariums and all that. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that's why it's challenging for us. So a couple yeah. of uh, more folks coming into the chat. I see Ryan Reeves. Hey, John, looking good. Hope to see you soon. Hey. Um, yep. What's up, Brian? Mark Fullen Wider, one of the best aquariums of all time at Angel Tank was. Greg, uh, Greg Carroll is, uh, is in the, uh, in the house here and, uh, it's great to have everybody. Yeah, Thanks for having team. me. We got one, let's, let's handle one quick question before we get into your system here. Mike Johnson's asking, uh, Hey, Keith and John got into SPS about six months ago. have had success with the standard beginner SPS, uh, bird's nest, Spontes, green slammer. What would be the next level sort of SPS to try out? What would you say? Oh, I mean, really, so the good thing about a local club is that um, if you just show up at, you know, a meeting, introduce yourself, you know, and it's all people hanging out and they will, uh, you know, you'll be able to get a hold of, you know, it might not be the most current, you know, $150 a frag something, you know, but a lot of people will give you corals. Um, you know, and, and you could sort of use those as kids. So I would say really whatever is accessible, um, to you, uh, you know, and don't worry about color. Don't worry about this, that, uh, you know, and you could sort of cut your teeth that way. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Another sort of shout out, um, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, yeah. So I'm looking, what is John's? <laughs> Ethnical background. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to get into all that stuff tonight's show, but uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah, Coppolino. It's not French. Yeah, no. yeah. So my four, my four grandparents were. Uh, so yeah, were Italian. let's um, let's let's. I'm going to show a couple of um, pictures of your 180 gallon um, system, and like I yes. said, there's going to be a little bit of a a lag in here, and um, you know, so I'm showing one shot of it. <clears throat> then I'll show another uh, shot of it. This thing. Yes, was... I don't see the shots yet, yeah. but so that 180 gallon. Uh, so, you know, I started slinging fish when I was whatever, 14 years old working there. I remember getting my first paycheck for two days of work, you know, whatever it was, $58. I think the, the minimum wage was five something an hour in Jersey back then. And uh, I, I couldn't believe I was getting paid to just hang out there, talk with people, bag their fish 
And, you know, and for the first while I would get paid in different <laughs> organisms and all that. <laughs> and then the cool thing I got being able to travel to wholesalers and all that. But that 180 gallon that I only broke down um, in 20. 13 when we built our house that <laughs> I bought that uh, when I was in high school um, and you know I, I talk about it a lot with you know I use the same sort of strategy with my mother when I was a kid as I use with my wife unfortunately it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission <laughs> um, my mother came to pick me up at work you know I was 15 whatever it was and there was you know she said oh my god what you know all my so I was born in Brooklyn my, my parents are from Brooklyn my mother, you know, is a, an Italian Brooklyn woman, perpetually treats me like I'm 12 years old uh, to this day. Um, and she walked in, you know, and she goes, oh, what is that? A tel it looked like a telephone booth. It was a six by two by two. And I said, mom, that's my new tank, um, you know, and, and oh, my, you know, of course. But but she was uh, both of my parents were very supportive. Um, you know, my mother, I could do no wrong with. She was very forgiving with allowing me anything. Um, and then, uh, my father, um, uh, was a, uh, he was a pilot in the U S air force, um, flew over 200 combat missions in Vietnam. Um, you know, fortunately for me survived. And, but one thing I credit with him, I grew up with attention to detail in everything. And he always drove it into our heads, uh, with, you know, whether it was like an unwashed fork in the sink, you know, uh, somehow if I left an unwashed fork in the sink, I'd get a lecture about how when he was commanding a unit, if this <laughs> and that happened, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, I, we all had problems when we were kids, but, but that attention to detail, um, has really, you know, that is just so important in this hobby, uh, because we all know, I mean, it's almost unlike any other hobby and that you could take it up, you could put it down, put it down. You know, if you do 99% of things right in this hobby, 1% wrong, that 1% can just, you know, cause everything to go crashing down. But that 180 gallon, yeah. So I set that back up. If people want to look, um, you could just Google like cops totem, uh, you know, it was on reef central. There's an article there. Um, and along with that six foot tank, I had a, I did a subtropical tank that I attached onto it. I had a mixed reef. I don't know if you have pictures of those, no. but that was in, that was in my last, um, so that was in our last house, our sort of stepping stone house. I, uh, uh, we moved into an apartment. We, we, we built our first house. I did five dedicated 20 amp circuits with that system. And then, you know, moved on to the house I'm in right now with the whole operation I have going. Uh, a yeah. couple quick questions from the viewers about the 180. Um, did that have sand? And, and how old was the um, the tank at the time of that picture, the couple of pictures I was showing? So that, those pictures, so that was actually 2011, I think those pictures were. That was when it was featured on Reef Central. And that tank at the time had only been set up probably um yeah, maybe four or five yeah. years. Yeah, uh, that tank I did not have um, sand in only because the flow in there was just so great. Um, and, you know, I, I actually I like the the idea of having a bare bottom, um, you know, sort of the methodology there. But I like having, uh, you know, when you're diving around the world and I, I do a lot of diving, you know, you, you never see just looks kind of sad having a bare bottom, but there's always that balance between the aesthetic, you know, having it pleasing like that with the sand and then um, keeping it clean and all that. So in my, uh, in my new system, I came up with a whole way of, um, cause one of the issues with SPS, especially when you're doing a giant tank, I used over a thousand pounds of rock. And, you know, if you're, laying sand down on the bottom of a tank and just piling the largest pieces were about 75 pounds. If you're just piling that on top of sand, uh, that's going to become an issue yeah. with detritus building up. So I, um, yeah, I profiled it in some of my threads. I, I basically used quarter inch acrylic sheets on the bottom in squares and I, I built up, uh, with epoxy and crushed coral, I built up mounds um, with rod cut with acrylic rod coming out and set my structure on top of that. Um, and then 
in the visible areas uh, is where I laid the crushed coral, but that so that it couldn't get back behind the uh, all of the detritus sort of settles in the areas that I can get to with the gravel back and all that, because that that's pretty much assuming, you know, you can keep an SPS tank. A lot of people, it, it's happened for years. They set it up, things start going great. And then, you know, it's been called OTS, old tank syndrome. And so really with SPS, and I've always kept a very high fish load, you know, it's just about keeping your tank young and keeping the ability to perpetually always just keep it going. Yep. And I'm, I'm showing know. a picture of the uh, of the tank before it was um, filled up and picture of a part of the scale. Yes, yeah, so you yeah. can see. Yeah, you can see right there that the pictures there, uh, all of that crushed coral was mixed with uh, epoxy and, you know, uh, hardened. Um, and I sort of built up, you know, I, I used uh, uh, I built up the base rock around that. And then um, so that that is basically impenetrable. Uh, and then the crushed coral, you know, in later pictures, I rolled in the crushed coral um, so that any, you know, any area where detritus get into, get into, I have access to with a gravel vacuum periodically. Yep. And I'm showing another uh, picture, but let's, um, let's back up though a little bit and um, talk about the, uh, the tank itself. So you went with a, um, a fiberglass tank, which, you know, again, is a, um, something that, public aquariums do right they'll uh because of certain yeah. size of aquarium this seemed to uh to make sense and then you had these glass viewing inserts right yes yeah so um so the tank you know as it started coming together um and you know i, I planned it for years i wanted to go something in the eight to ten foot long range and then you know, I hate skinny tanks, um, whether they're small or large, even if it's a nano. I like the front to back dimension, you know, to be uh, a certain amount, uh, just so it allows you to create something that looks like a reef and less like an aquarium. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, the tank ended up being eight and a half feet long, uh, six feet wide. And I wanted to do two sides viewable because I always loved, you know, even those of us with the old 55 gallon or 75, when you look down the side of the tank and you see it that way, you know, it's just, I, I love that view. So having the six foot side viewable uh, allows me to have eight and a half, you know, foot view front to back. Um, and so it, it was an FRP tank um, that large. So it ended up, I wanted 30 inch viewing windows with the uh, their uh, Starfire panels. And to have a 30 inch viewing window, the tank had to be built 42 inches high. Um, mm. So eight and a half by six by 42 inches high, that equals, you know, something just over 1300 gallons. Um, and <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, um, it just sort of kept inching up and up and up. So to have a 1300 gallon tank, uh, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an acrylic guy, uh, you know, as many people aren't just dealing with the scratches and all that, it's not necessary. So to have an, a, a full glass aquarium built that large, it would have to be built on site. And you'd be dealing with a lot of seams and all that. And I go to a lot of public aquariums. They have these FRP tanks that are, you know, decades and decades mm. old, you know, and there's really so few failure points on them. You know, they put the glass, they inset it on the inside, um, you know, so few failure points. And I had one hole drilled in the tank, um, it's a one inch drain in the far corner uh, and I use that for water changes. So the whole system is just short of 2000 gallons. Um, I do 200 gallon water changes. It's one box of reef crystals. I turn the return pumps off and I open up that one valve on that one inch drain. It drains exactly 200 gallons of water. Close it off, move a few ball valves, 200 gallons of water back in. Obviously with a tank this big, you're not sloughing buckets or around or anything like that so yeah there was a lot that went into the engineering of it as there is with anything well I, I always say and i agree with you that um width or depth whatever you want to call it is is really i think the most uh important um dimension on a tank and i always say go as wide as you can go because it just gives you so many more options with aquascaping and and uh you know i started a new peninsula tank and it's a 225 gallon peninsula tank and i went 36 inches wide with that tank and i just i'm really in digging it 
Uh, so 36 inches is pretty much the goal. Yeah, my mixed reef, I call it, where I have, uh, it's really an anemone display, a bunch of gigantic anemone. It's only five feet long, but it's three feet wide. Um, and, you know, one of the things people get, uh, it happened with me when I, when I was a kid, you know, the 50, the old 55 gallon, 13 inches wide, but with the size of it, it was inexpensive. Yeah. It was four feet long, you know, and the 75 gallon, which was 18 inches wide, I think was something like twice the price than a 55. Yeah. So people always want to, and to this day, people, they want the longest tank, longest tank. And then they sort of get scared, you know, scared as they start beefing it up and you look at the gallons of it. So, um, hopefully that's changing because, you know, uh, anything with depth, it just, again, allows for just incredible aquascapes. Yeah. Talk to us about the plumbing. So you, you, uh, you mentioned that there's only one hole drilled in that tank. So talk to us about what you have in terms of for drains and for returns on that, uh, that system. I'm showing, I'm showing yeah, a picture of so, it right now. Yeah. So let me, um, so the, the whole system, um, it has the 1300 gallon SPS display, uh, it has that 240 gallon mixed reef. Um, and then I did two six foot frag tanks, six foot by two foot, or if I sort of call them off display tanks. So that the picture we're looking at right here with all those circles, I'll sort of go through that. Um, that purple circle, that is the one inch drain, uh, which I use for water changes. Um, so the good thing is now's a good time to bring up my electric bill. I want it to keep down absolutely as much as possible because, you know, my wife sees it every month. It comes every month. Um, and the um, having the ability to use uh, for the flow in that tank in the red and the green, 1300 gallons, most all of the flow I get are from six MP60s. Um, the three in the red, I have turned on for 10 minutes at a time. So that's drawing less than 200 watts. I get a gyro going one way for 10 minutes and then those three turn off and the three in green turn on and it gets a gyro going the other way. Um, the two blue circles are, those are where my return com pumps come in. Uh, I'm using Ecotech Vectra's, again, DC pumps. They're, you know, they, they had sort of, uh, when they came out, they had reliability issues, all that, but I use redundant return pumps and those actually go through uh, uh, one and a half inch sea swirls just to create a little bit of added, you know, chaotic motion. Um, so I have two return pumps dedicated to the 1300 gallon uh, tank. Both of them go through their own uh, three horsepower chiller. Um, and um, yeah, and both of those chillers could handle, uh, you know, they're set up for redundancy. Basically, you know, when I engineered this, there's no... Uh, any point of failure is not catastrophic. So if a pump goes down, you know, I have redundancy there um, and all that. Um, so we could talk about some of the other things uh, I came up with, you know, shades to go around the tank that keep the carpet surfers in, but allow for airflow through. Uh, there was a lot that went through this, but, and then there's four two inch drains there. Uh, two of those directly feed into my protein skimmer. One of them uh, takes the rest of it, and then the fourth one is uh, not used. It's purely, you know, if if uh, uh, if uh, if any of the other ones clog up or fail, it will go over into that. Yeah. So I'm going to show this uh, this cute picture here of um, your uh, your kids in front of the uh, the tank. I think it's before it was um, actually moved into place there. And, and your son, the look on your son's face is, I think, says it all. <laughs> <laughs> so i yeah the picture didn't come up yet but i know exactly what uh photo that is so that was um in about 2012 2013 um when so this was a fully custom built tank um it they made their own mold for it um so you know it's basically like a fiberglass boat but they made their own mold for it um, and we, uh, this was in the garage of my old home. So I actually had this tank delivered to the garage of my old home before it was only a three mile move, uh, so that I had it ready. As soon as we closed on our new home, I could move it in. Um, so to give you an idea, that's my son, Nick, he just turned 16 
yesterday. You know, he's taller than me now. He works out, you know, six days a week with his friend. You know, I mean, I have old man strength. I could still take, you know, and then my daughter turns 13 next week. Uh, but yeah, my son, he has the bug. He takes care of my tanks when I'm on travel now. Um, you know, and, and his face said it all because they, uh, yeah, they could not know how big it was. Um, oh, the movie you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, so, that's quite a look that guy's so, got in his face there. <laughs> yeah, so the mover thing, the, um, so there were so many things I planned for this system and budgeted for, um, you know, but there's only so much you could plan for. I, what ended up happening, uh, we had that tank, I had it delivered. It was built in Massachusetts, a company called Fiberglass Specialties. They've done a whole bunch of the tanks for, uh, uh Joey Ayulo in, uh, at the Long Island, uh, at the Long Island Aquarium. Um, and I had it delivered uh, to our old house. Uh, and I contacted a rigging company to move it three miles and have it set in our new house, you know, with a crane and mm -hmm. everything and enough manpower. The quote I got for that was $7,000. So I live in Northern Virginia. It's you know, it's um, just the cost of anything like that is exorbitant. Um, and fortunately I was able to find a moving company. Uh, there's a whole story behind the moving company there. They, I ended up going with a company called mover dudes <laughs> that I originally overlooked. You, you, you trusted a place want, called mover dudes. I, your well, dream what happened, I overlooked them originally and I just started calling places and there were one of two answers. One of them, people would listen. They'd go, you have a 1300 gallon tank. That's glass. Yeah. We're not touching that. The other ones. It's almost like I, I could have said, you know, I have I have, you know, 10 pet gorillas I need to move. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll do it. You know, I'm like they weren't listening. I ended up calling mover dudes that I originally overlooked. The owner, he had questions, you know. He was like, a, you know, an intelligent guy, inquisitive. He said, "Can I come over take a look?" I said, "Yes. Nice. Yes, please come take a look." He came over, you know, he said, I think we could do this with five guys. I'll never forget. And I said, all right, good. Bring six. I'll pay for <laughs> six. And um, and they ended up doing it. You know, you could see through those pictures. It was pretty Herculean uh, with how they did it, you know, and it cost me, you know, I think under a thousand bucks to get it moved that three miles and put in the house. Wow. I just um, paid thirteen hundred yeah. bucks this past uh, fall to have my new 225 gallon peninsula tank moved from my driveway down to the basement i just I, oh, and man. you know i've been i'm in vermont right and so there's not a lot of options in terms of moving companies and i uh yeah. the last time i had a tank moved here i think i paid um four guys um 50 bucks a piece or something like that you know there were like just yeah. uh, some local guys that that uh actually had some suction cups and they did the job for me and and i was like cool. I'm going to call yeah. these guys back up and, and have them come back and do this, uh, this, uh, this other tank. And they, they didn't want any part of it anymore. You know, the guy was like retiring. And, and so there was, I couldn't find any <laughs> other, uh, moving companies. So it was like, man, I got fleeced, but, uh, yeah. So what we have, our club Whamus, we actually have, uh, for use by any of the club members. And it's the perfect thing for a club to have those big suction cups. Yeah. You know, it's something you'll use two or three times in your life. So my second largest tank was 350 gallons, all three quarter inch glass, weighed over a thousand pounds. And actually with my local fish friends and, you know, we were able to move that in, didn't even need movers for that. So, uh, uh, but it was funny. I did ask mover dudes after that, you know, I said, would you, would you do this again? And the guy's like, probably <laughs> So whoever not. buys, if, if you ever, if you ever because, sell that house, then the tank's going to stay in that house. Oh yeah. I mean, well, my wife said I'm going to get buried in the tank. Um, so that'll be my, that'll be my coffin wherever I end up. So I'll need a big footprint. Uh, so yeah. I got yeah, a picture yeah, yeah. now you, uh, in front of the tank and, and it looks beautiful in terms of the, uh, the stonework and what have you. Yeah. So, uh, again, um, uh, we sort of have like a contemporary, you know, I, I like, I like natural stone, uh, but I, you know, I sort of have like a contemporary style. So we found that stacked rock, um, and that I really like it's natural stone, but it's set up in a contemporary way. Uh, I have to throw a shout out to one of my, uh, local friends at the time, Adam Dilks. Um, 
another hardcore hobbyist, but you know, he's like, he's like Bob Vila, you know, just really, really can do anything can, you know, I'm fairly handy myself, but you know, he was, you know, helped me put up the rock, help help me do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of all this without him. I would not have been able to do a lot of the construction aspect of it. Um, because, uh, yeah, because I, you know, th this wasn't an aquarium maintenance company. I, I did, I did everything with this. Um, you know, uh, I didn't have a company come in and do this, I, you know, and really that's the only way I would have done it because I was very specific with what I wanted. Uh, yeah. So this was in the construction phase of it. Um, yeah. Setting things up. Um, so talk to us about the, um, the aquascape. And so you, you started this tank with dry rock, right? And, and, uh, you, you took your time in yeah. terms of doing the aquascape. Had you, had, was this, the, was this your first yeah, dry yeah. rock only tank? Um, this what what was yeah full dry rock from scratch yeah um yeah i mean really a tank this large there is no way you know i mean there is no way i used over a thousand pounds you know even back in the day when you can get live rock and all that i mean to to bring in the live rock to uh yeah. you know i mean i guess you physically could do it but this was like a one-man operation one thing i realized you know, I saw all these German systems, the, you know, Ching Chai's tank and, you know, uh, you know, where he had like 14 laborers in there setting things up, you know, and then you look at the, you know, I've seen these European guys that, uh, you know, that, that have way more money than I do just paying for all the, you know, I mean, every rock in there was hand placed by me. Um, it took, uh, yeah, I mean, it took a long time. So, Really, there was no other way. And what I did, so it was a three mile move. All of this that you're seeing here, I kept my old house. I would go there before work and after work um, for months. We paid two mortgages and um, fortunately the market in our area was going up. Um, and I was able to slowly, cause we all know setting up new systems, um, it, it just takes time. And the big problem with moving stuff is rushing. And, and the thing about dry rock is it takes yeah. time. Um, you know, but I mean, it, it was much more, uh, you know, I could really control things, uh, set it up and, you know, not rush things. So I, you know, I had it running for a few months and then I started bringing over live rock, you know, started bringing over fish. The corals I put in there were all from that 180 gallon uh, when I moved it over, uh, I very rarely get new corals. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I look at this and, and I'm nervous right now, even just thinking of it. Um, it's just amazing what our passions can do. If, if, you know, if only one or two things went wrong, it could have been, uh, yeah. potentially catastrophic, oh, for sure. but it all came together. So you yeah. were, um, you were essentially kind of cooking the rock at the, uh, the old place. And then when it, um, was, no, so no, so the old place had my system as you showed that right. 180 right. gallon. I just kept it running so that I can get the new system just with oh, okay. water in it, just with bacteria, getting it not only cycled. You know, there's the initial ammonia nitrite yeah. cycle, but with you know, as reef hobbyists, we know it's beyond that. Just as different things get coated in bacteria, and the rock sort of goes through its uh, you know, it's maturation and all of that. I mean, you really can't rush that. You could help it along and things like that. So, so I did that for a few months and then I slowly brought over corals and then eventually just broke down the old system and got rid of it. Did you yeah. have any ugly phases with the, uh, with the new tank? Did you run into any uh, problematic algae or? Yeah. So, well, to me, it wasn't problematic. Um, it went through algae blooms, hair algae, all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people, they talk about setting up with dry rock and all the problems and all, you know, uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a combination of just mixing in the correct, you know, live rocks, what you want to get in there and then getting, getting grazers and controlling nutrients and just allowing time. It takes more time. You know, I mean, you had live rock back in the day, you'd set it up and, you know, it cycle in a few weeks and you were money. Um, this took time, but again, I really didn't have an option. Um, you know, if I was going to, cause I had some, again, the largest rocks were 75 pounds. I always recommend with aquascaping, even if you have a nano, 
you know, don't buy any way you stack a group of, of lemons. It looks like a stack of lemons, right? If you take, you know, but if you take instead of a giant stack of lemons, you take, you know, three or four large boulders, you set them in different ways and you create better aquascapes. So I always recommend people start with large rocks. You know, it just makes for more interesting aquascapes. So, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I could have, uh, you know, like some of these European guys, they could have arranged to have all this live rock, brought, but, you know, I, I was in no rush. Um, you know, I'm a lifer in this hobby, like many of us, uh, you know, I'll always be in it. What do you, so. what do you think about this uh, trend of these, like, negative uh, space aquascapes, Th these NSAs, these, all these, uh, I mean, they look really cool, like almost bonsai type of yeah. race. What, what are your thoughts on something like that? I I mean, I, I love it. I the, the type of person I am, um, you know, if, if we all had the same outlook in this hobby and we all created the same tanks and we all, it would be a boring hobby. You know, uh, I think what makes this hobby great is that every reefer is their own individual. And it's just like artists. You know, if everybody was Picasso, Picasso was amazing and all. If every artist was like Picasso, though, it, art would yeah. suck, you know. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, all of that, I, I think it's fantastic to look. You go, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. And a lot of us, we sort of take it all in and then, you know, we grab our paintbrush and we paint based on you know how we've been influenced so you know i'm all for all that i, I think it's super neat yeah. so you you mentioned that um you know you so you you seeded the tank with bacteria to help help the cycle get going have um have you ever dosed bacteria you know after the tank had had cycled and matured because that's uh that's something that um you yeah. know i know some folks are doing i'm i'm experimenting with a little bit uh in terms of dosing bacteria but that's not something that you've ever done no, no. So pretty much my methodologies have really not changed. So I do very little, you know, uh, experimenting new things. And then the other thing, you have a 2000 gallon system, you know, I, I don't want to bring an experiment, yeah. you know, um, that's for, uh, you know, I do have, you know, I have a coral quarantine system. It's a fully set up um, 65 gallon um, that, you know, I moved over. It was one of my ancillary tanks, um, back in the day. And, you know, I use that for coral quarantine and, and uh, things like that. But really my methodology is I'm, you know, I'm sort of, uh, an old guy shaking my cane. What, what I've done for years has worked and I'm not against, you know, I'm not the type of reefer that says, you know, it's my way or the highway. You know, I just say, this is what I do. This is what I create. And, you know, if somebody does something different, I mean, more power to them, whatever works. But what I do recommend is that a lot of people get into this hobby and they go online and, you know, they listen to not necessarily the most experienced reefers, but they just listen to this guy posting that guy, you know, and they're, you know, they're sort of the people that speak the loudest online, but they're not really, uh, you know, if you can go to your local club where speakers are brought in and just speak to a lot of the old salts uh, that have been in it and have, you know, experience gets you a lot uh, and sort of learn from them, um, you know, and uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, so. I just put out a video a couple of weeks ago kind of talking about what you were just uh, saying with, with the social media and, and all the uh, reef tank forums is that it's today, in today's day and age, it's so easy to perhaps uh, get misinformed because there's a lot of different opinions out there and sometimes the uh, the people that are speaking the loudest might not necessarily be the most successful and how do you um try yeah. to like get through all that noise you know how do you uh filter out what's what's the good information what's the bad information i think you know when you and i started in this hobby there was um you know a lot of experts and and they wrote books and you know, I, I learned a lot by reading books, but also by going uh, to frag swaps and, and talking to like real, um, you know, experts that have had a lot of success. Yeah. Yep. And and I think one one other thing that people that have been in the hobby a long time get is that, you know, we sort of you sort of know now when people set up tanks, they have a bottle of this, they dose this, they do they they do all of these things. And, you know, that's fine if that works. But you know, I mean, really, to do all of those things before you've realized how to just create, you know, we have to sort of simplify our hobby. All that's going on in our tanks, really, you know, you have a freshly made up bucket of salt water. And 
you're adding a nutrient source to that, whether it's feeding your fish or whatever. So there's a bucket with water in it, circulation, a little bit of food, and all you're really trying to do, all these proteins, all these things we have, lighting, all of this, we're just trying to get our water quality back to that freshly made up bucket of seawater, you know, with a little bit of a protein source and nutrient source and all, you know. And um, yeah, I think a, a lot of people have just gotten to the point where they're, you know, uh, that's fine dosing all of these things and, you know, all this modern reef keeping, but they, they, they really don't know, you know, when things go wrong, they, they don't know what's causing what and what, you know, and how to set up a, uh, you know, so we're just, a lot of us learn by just killing things when we were kids and, and, you know, uh, so it's sort of a double-edged sword. You have so many, uh, so many outlets right now and, you know, where you can get information, but, it's kind of like trying to drink from a fire hose. You know, the easy way to do it is just talk to the old salts, you know, get their recommendations and, and uh, just see what people are doing. And it's not even the old salts. It's somebody that can create a beautiful aquarium and has kept it going for a while. Say, all right, what do you do? You know, you're doing something that works, you know, not somebody who got in the hobby last year and had a tank six months and, you know, something right. like and, that. And, so, and kind yeah. of like, you know, find a method that um, you like that that uh, somebody's had success with and just stick with it and don't make a lot of changes you know kind of stick with that one method and and the more consistency that you uh will have in terms of just not changing stuff up you know i find helps a lot too yeah um so let, let's uh let's 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 talk some more about the uh the setup so um obviously you're going to be using a calcium reactor on this tank because it's it's got a lot of uh you know high demand for sps uh, I'm going to show a quick um, picture of that calcium reactor. I think you had that custom made by, uh, yeah. yeah. So an actual, yeah, sort of a, uh, uh, I have not, and I apologize, I have not updated my thread. Um, travel this year, I was on travel first six months of this year, 97 days. Oh, my gosh. Um, for, uh, yeah, and that was, uh, some of that was from vacation, Um you know, we're doing all 50 states with the kids. I'm like Clark Griswold. We did New Mexico this summer. We did uh, we did Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, including Yellowstone wow. Glacier. But a lot of that was work travel, which I don't normally have. But last year during COVID, you know, pretty much home. A lot of my work got backed up. So I haven't fully updated. Um, I actually turned off my calcium reactor. Um, I think it was last year. Uh, and I am running purely right now on oh, Cal wow. and good old Bob Stark, um, two part Bionic. Really? I you're, you're through doing two part gallons. Yeah. I, so I've always done two part in addition to, so what happened was, um, so I've always had work travel. I'm never on travel more than two or three weeks at a time. And when I would travel, we all know, you know, these sort of ebbs and flows, of uh our tank you know one coral will take off and you'll have yeah. to you know so i i would for years i had my calcium reactor set up and i would supplement with two part and according to where i was testing out with alkalinity that's what would fluctuate because tweaking a calcium reactor is not necessarily something that you know um you know, I could have my father yeah. do. My father would originally take care of the tanks. He does when we go on trip. So I would uh, tweak the amount of Bionic. But the reason I really turned off my calcium reactor uh, was just more of a pH issue. Um, you know, I was cranking up my calcium reactor and doing less two-part. And my pH would drop, drop, drop. And, you know, even keeping my pH up, I'm in a large sealed house and that was always an issue. And it's funny, when we all go on vacation, I'll see my pH, nobody's in yeah. the house, you know, it's just my dad and, and my pH will go up. And so, you know, I'm sitting there with this giant tank of CO2, blah, 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 you know, just pushing CO2 into my, and I realize, you know, that's great, it worked, but it's not necessary at all. And, you know, I pretty much proved it was probably over a year ago that I, I, uh, shut off my calcium reactor just because, uh, you know, and, you know, the drawback of that is, you know, I, I pay part of Bob Stark's uh, <laughs> mortgage there in New York with his two part, but he's, how, you so know, I, I get it. How many MLs a day are you doing two part right now? Uh, I don't know what it is in MLs, but I'm about um, more or less four cups per day of each part. 
uh, you know, so a quarter gallon per part. Um, and actually what I do, uh, you know, I'm kind of an old salt in terms of things, but I have a KH director, uh, you know, that yep. automatically tests my alkalinity, but I do not have it controlled. Oh, really? yeah. I have it monitor. Yeah. And I'm the same thing with my apex. All of these things, you know, you do the monitoring, you feed me the information and I'll do the controlling. So, you know, all I do, I'm away, you know, when I'm away or whenever, you know, my cage director spits out my alkalinity and then I tell, you know, uh, either I'll dose it or I'll tell my son, he puts that amount, you know, fills up that amount of two part that doses over the next 18 hours and then the same thing the next day. So I'm always sort of just tweaking my two part uh, that I put in there. And then also I'm doing um jesus i don't know probably almost what i evaporate off i i had calculated it at one point but you know over 10 gallons of full strength calc washer a day um probably into it uh you know so that helps keep my ph up the two bar keeps my ph up so um yeah 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 uh, so i, I had um yeah. on my 187 uh gallon established system you know which is about uh i don't know four four years old right now and it's just heavy sps i had um, been dosing two part and i had been dosing about 300 mls a day on two part bionic esv so i um you know my ph was really good you know in the um eight one to eight three range and all that stuff but um, i just kind of wanted to um save some money on on the bionic stuff so i did switch over to a calcium reactor and i've used calcium reactors for years, you know, and, and, um, my first calcium reactor was the, I still have it actually the Marine, remember the Marine technical concepts, the, uh, the two chamber, the so, dual yep. chamber MTC, <laughs> that, yep, kind of yep. an old quirky yeah. guy that, uh, owned that company. I forget his name, yeah. but, um, anyway, so I went back to a, a, a calcium reactor and, and, um, what I, what I did before I, I had done that was I had a, um, an air exchange unit installed in the, uh, in the basement of the house to, to try to combat the, uh, the CO2 issue because, you know, in Vermont wintertime, the, the windows are sealed up, you know, tightly. So that, that definitely helped. And, and I also have been, um, dripping the effluent into the, uh, into the skimmer pump. So my, my pH even with, and I, and I dose cockwasser too. So my pH has been in the eight, one to eight, four range, you know, on that tank with a calcium reactor. So it's, it, it's, it's worked out pretty good, um, for me, but I know that, um, you know, the, um, it's, it's could be a different situation in a, in a different, uh, you know, setup and that pH yeah. is a challenge. And I would have done, I mean, the issue is just that, well, for one, the amount of air I'd need to pull in and then, you know, I'm friends with Julia and all that, you know, you never know what the hell tree's going to bloom or, you know, uh, something, you know, I, I just don't feel that comfortable pulling in that amount of air that I would need and then, you know, just having 2000 gallons and I have coral growing everywhere. I mean, the amount of CO2 that I was just pumping, yeah, pumping, bet. pumping into, my, yeah. you know, so the drawback of it is, you know, uh, again, a little, it's, a little, a little <laughs> bit more expensive. So let's, let's talk about, yeah. um, uh, UV sterilizers. And I'm showing a picture of you with this, uh, ginormous UV sterilizer that you'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know the picture of yeah. it, but, uh, talk to us about yep. using UV in a reef tank and why you'd like to do it. Yeah. So this is something that, you know, like anything else you could look online and you have all these people. No, it doesn't. Yes. You know, and then you talk to the actual people that have had success with it. And, um, one of my, um, uh, big, you know, the reasons I did this, the, I go to Hawaii a lot with work, uh, and, you know, I stay right in Waikiki, I work in Pearl Harbor and, you know, I'm at the Waikiki Aquarium. I've been going, you know, for 20 years, I've been going there, you know, through Karen Britton, Charles Delbake, um, you know, they've had uh, rich pile work there back in the day, uh, you know, and they have, it's, they don't have flipping dolphins or Shamu, but it's an incredible, very historic aquarium. And one of the interesting things is that they actually pull their, uh, so they pull their water from underground for a lot of their exhibits, but for a lot of their coral exhibits, they just run a hose out into the ocean and pull that water because they have issues with, from their well, I think it's inorganic phosphates or so, something weird like that. So they would just pull water in, um, which is great. But the issue with that is it would continually bring in cryptocarrion and, and you know, any sort of so they've used uh, UV with success. Uh, and what you found is that, you know, and the other thing, Kevin Cohen, you know, who was with Live Aquaria for years, used UV with success. 
Uh, but what you find is you need a lot of it. It needs to be properly planned. And it can't be, you know, I always tell people, you know, keep Mickey Mouse at Disney World. <laughs> You know, they get this little thing, you know, that like they order off Amazon for 40 bucks, they hook it up and they and they, you know, and then their fish get whatever, you know, whatever parasite and they say, oh, UV doesn't work. You know, um, I like, you know, the Emperor Aquatics units. They're very easy to uh, it's a 300 watt unit. I have 250 watt tubes. Um, I swap out the sleeves um, the, the bulbs last about a year, but I swap out the sleeves actually every other month and I have two sets of sleeves. I soak them in muriatic acid because what happens is they'll get that haze. And even though your bulb is good, and this is one of the things I've learned from a lot of public aquarium people, they, that, uh, you know, you have to keep your sleeve clean because even though the bulb is good, it's emitting enough to have an impact. Uh, your sleeve gets coated. Um, so that's one thing. And, you know, I'm kind of a hardcore fish guy. If you look through, you know, some of my, I, I just like keeping, I don't like keeping rare fish. You know, I, one of the things I always tell people, if you have to ask if it's rare, you don't deserve it. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, people should not be buying rare because it's rare. Really, you know, the only reason I supposedly get rare is because it just gives me the same excitement I had, you know, when I was 12 years old, you know, seeing, you know, getting, you know, flame angel, coral, you know, uh, any of those more common things, you know, I, they're things that I only saw in books as a kid, were exposed to them now, you know, this is my vice, so I don't mind paying for certain things. So, and really, you know, a lot of our fish, I've had, you know, from my original kitchen nano 20 years ago, I have my original Solomon Islands Percola. I have a Tamini Tang, you know, that I've had uh, since 2002. Um, you know, a lot of our fish could live 40, 50 years plus if our stupidity doesn't kill them. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happens. Um, you know, people always try and point thing, you know, point fingers, all this. I'll never forget Mitch Carl, uh, for anybody that knows Mitch, he's a fantastic guy. Uh, he's in Nebraska. Um, you know, he wrote, he wrote an article called, you know, he's got a really good sense of humor, uh, thing called things that suck acro eating flatworms. Mm. He did an article on flatworms years ago. And one of the things he talked about, you know, if your acros are dying, you might have acro eating flatworms. One of the other things he said, he said, um, if all your corals are dying or recessing, the thing that sucks might be you. Yeah. <laughs> and well really, <laughs> it's 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 true. I mean, a lot of people they blame this, they blame that. They, you know, you sort of have to take a step back, be humble, and go. You know what? I'm doing something wrong here. You know, they always try and point fingers, all that. So I thought that was funny when I read that from Mitch. That always sticks in my but, head. But <laughs> uh, in terms of UV and and with a uh, you know corals SPS, you have not found it to be detrimental at all in terms of um no as a matter of fact i found it to be uh it took me a while to get it going and one of the things it really helps with in a larger system you know that a lot of us don't have to deal with because you're not you know i'm looking through over eight feet of water so if my water is not clear yeah. that's an issue and a lot of people even on a four foot tank if you look down uh, but in terms of the bacterial blooms and I mean, it just clears the yeah. water. Um, so it's had advantages to that, but you know, I'm not one of those big, um, you know, I feed my fish, you know, I don't feed my coral. Uh, so I'm not really worried about it killing anything beneficial. I've run it for years and you know, whatever I have is working right. So, so no, uh, no amino acids, no coral food. You just feed your fish and you just let the, the, uh, the fish poop, uh, do its uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I have no problem with uh, a lot of these products, but again, you know, I mean, they would, uh, uh, you know, I have no problem paying Bob Stark at Bionic, but I look at a lot of these products and I, you know, I, I'd spend, <laughs> I'd spend a fortune uh, to do that. And, um, and, you know, again, the system I have works well, you know, I feed heavy, I deal with nutrients on the back end and, you know, um, I really haven't had any reason to change it. So I have no problem with people doing it, but it's just not for me. What, yeah. um, what are your key parameters at in terms of nitrates and phosphates, calcium, alkalinity? Uh, so when I would test them, um, I was always low single digits on nitrates. Um, my phosphates, the highest I really ever tested them at probably 
0.12, you know, on the low end, maybe 0.04. I'm always sort of in that end. Um, and, you know, it's been a few years now since I've tested, I have my perpetual system that, you know, and I'm one of those guys, I could tell just by looking at my corals, you know, uh, when there's an issue, um, you know, so I really haven't set off testing in a while. What, you know? um, you know, so in, in, in terms of, um, nutrient export, you've obviously got a protein skimmer. Are you doing any, uh, macro or do you, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, um, so my protein skimmer, um, built by a vast Marine, um, same people that built my, uh, calcium reactor, um, and just two great guys, uh, Justin Casp, Dan Lichens, they were, they're local to me. They were in my club, um, before they were even in the business. And, uh, Dan was always one of those tinkerers, one of those guys that, Anything he built, I just really respect him. And you sort of, anybody that builds something like I did, you have your subject matter experts. And Dan uh, and Justin, they know what I want. You know, they know how I want it built. And if I ever have a problem, they, you know, they're, they're, they're quick to respond, all that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I have my giant protein skimmer. And then I actually have a six foot long by two foot by like 13 inch uh, refugium, we'll call it a refugium. Really, it's just a, you know, a catamorpha factory, you yeah. know, that I always keep going on the, uh, I always keep it on the offensive. Yeah. And, you know, I always recommend people with that. A lot of people do sort of defensive reefing. They look, you know, their tank's doing well and they don't really do much because it's doing well. And then it starts failing. And then, you know, they start going on the defensive, you know, you should be, as your tank's doing well, keeping up with your regimens, you know, so that you're just constantly on the offensive, uh, you know, so I always keep my catamorpha, you know, I'm always harvesting it, always keeping it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's a system that's worked. It's fairly simple, but. Are you yeah. dosing anything to help the, uh, the Cato, uh, grow like any iron or any nitrates, phosphates, or do you, uh, just really just keep your, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I do, you know, I do regular, it's the 10% water changes. I do my Bionic, um, and yeah. And, you know, but I do have a, you know, I always keep a heavy fish load and I feed very heavy and I've always done that through the years. And, you know, even back in the day, you know, I've just kept colorful SPS with that, but you know, I deal with the nutrients on the back end. You have to keep on top of that. And I, you know, one of the things I always do, you know, that I recommend people just say no to detritus. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just sort of anywhere you allow that to build up that will, you know, I'm not fully sure of the, you know, the, uh, what's going on chemically or, you know, but I know that when I clean sweep my tank, I brush off the live rock. I do not allow it to build up. You know, it just bounces your tank back and, and things just do much better. How yeah. often are you, uh, are, are you using like a, uh, a power head to blow detritus off of the rocks? Are you using a turkey baster? Oh yeah. Well, in my system, it's, yeah, I, I just use a large pump on, uh, you know, and I do it very infrequently. Uh, I have giant gravel vacuums and then I just get in there with, um, you know, I mean, a turkey baster doesn't really yeah. work on, on 13. I mean, yeah, that would that'd be, be a lot of, that'd be a lot of basting. <laughs> I don't want well, yeah, no, I look like Popeye. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's nothing really, uh, yeah, nothing really, but I just do get in there and I get it out. And then again, through proper system design, the way I've designed my system, you know, all of the detritus it doesn't really build up behind the rock structure because, you know, I have those mounds of, um, you know, it's built up high. I have mounds of epoxy and crushed coral so that any detritus settles into the visible areas. And I'll go in with a gravel back every, you know, a couple months or so. Yeah. So, uh, John, let, one, one topic we haven't talked about is, uh, is lighting. And uh, you are a, um, a metal halide guy, correct? Still, a yeah, metal halide. So, yeah. So talk to us about the lighting, you know, and, and a lot of public aquariums uh, do use metal halide lighting because they have tall tanks and they need the uh, the penetration yeah. with the uh, with the metal halide lights. Have you ever um, thought about going to LEDs or is that just not? Uh... So I actually have um, I do have uh, I have five Ecotech Radeon. I think they're Gen 3 Pros um, on my tank. Um the issue I have, you know, and I love Ecotech, fantastic company. Um, you know, the, the issue I have with LEDs, 
Uh, right now, over my 1300, it's mainly lit by six 400 watt 14 K Ushios that, you know, it's 42 inch deep tank. I have the five radions, but I just use the blue and red channels there. Uh, and believe it or not, I still have some VHO tubes, oh, wow. uh, that will soon, that will soon be going away because, uh, I was like Elaine on that episode of Seinfeld, uh, buying out the last of the sponges. <laughs> you know, I have the the last of the uh, – so I'll probably replace those with strips of LED. But the reason I do those is because I, I like to sort of kick the 14K Ushios a little bluer. And then also uh, my halides I run seven hours a day. You know, I like to wake the fish up in the yep. morning. And But – you know, when people talk about the advantages to LED, you know, they talk about, OK, bulb changes. You have to change the bulb. You know, for me, that's a $50 bulb. Right. So I'm buying $300 in bulbs once a year. OK. As a replacement. If one of the bulbs goes, I swap the bulb. If a ballast goes, I swap the ballast. Right. I have six of those. Right. If I wanted to do a lot of these LED fixtures to do it over 1300 gallons. OK. All right, I'd need to buy, you know, whatever, $15,000 and, you know, or whatever, line them all up. And, you know, it would just be a tremendous amount. And then, you know, okay, even they had people calculated out like LEDs, you know, okay, the diode might, you know, outlive my children or something, but something is going to fail on that fixture. So if I have that initial investment and I layer it over my tank, you know, and then 10 years down the line or whenever those start failing, you know, I have to look at, OK, I have to replace this, that, that yeah. one Then I'm replacing it with a different, you know, I mean, there's so many dynamics to it. I just like, you know, the simplicity of halides. It's a ballad. There's only certain failure points. And um, yeah, you know, uh, and the, the heat, the way I deal with that. So I have my six foot frag tanks. One of the way, ways I design my system, I light my frag tanks overnight. I light the reefs during the day uh, because we've had these advancements in wave making that keep our electricity bills down. You know, but one of the things to heat or chill 2000 gallons of water is friggin yeah. expensive. You know, and as I look to all my public aquarium buddies, one of the things they laugh about, you know, I mean, Joe, Joe's bill in Long Island, you know, I think $90,000. He has some extravagant electric bill, you know, and a lot of these guys, they sort of, you know, it's like they laugh. It's not like it's getting delivered to their what's a public yeah. aquarium. So I had to be concerned with that. So, uh, yeah. So even though I have chillers, I don't depend on them. They're more sort of for backup. So the system always stays really between 76 and 81 degrees throughout the year without me heating or chilling, uh, which was another thing I wanted to, um, you know, by lighting my, my frag tanks overnight, I don't have to heat the system and then chill it down. So, um, yeah, so that was another thing I had to engineer in there. Yeah. I do something similar. Actually, I, I change the schedule of my frag tank lights in the uh, in the summertime because it does get a little um, you know hot in the uh, in the basement here. So I'll um, I'll move that light yeah. cycle up and I'll I'll instead of it being on the same you know I've got halides on my display and both and both frag tanks. So instead of it, you know the halides being on in the uh, display in the frag tanks from like uh, one to nine. They're on, you know, in the frag tank uh, room, they're on, they start on at like a 10, they shut off at six. So I've kind of staggered that way, you know, so it's not all on yep. the same time and, you know, that's a way to manage it. And I, I also use yep. fans and, and, you know, the, uh, the goal is for the fans to kick on and, and not to, um, you know, to kind of prevent uh, the, uh, the chiller from going on, but sometimes it will. But, you know, it's a game. Yes. Evaporative cooling is fantastic unless you have 2,500 gallons in your house. Yes. <laughs> you cannot rely on evaporative cooling. Yes. There will be humidity issues. Absolutely. So, John, I want to be, yeah. uh, I want to be uh, conscious of your, uh, your time. You're out on the, uh, the West Coast here. You're on a business trip. You're doing us a big solid by, uh, by, being, on the, uh, <laughs> by being on the show tonight. Yes. So, I was supposed to be home. I got called oh, out a week man, early. A so, yeah. yeah. Um, so before we, uh, we wrap it up, what um, – what would you say are the three tips that uh, if you could pass along to somebody for having success with SPS, what would those three tips be? Oh man. Um, let's see three. Well, um, all right. Well, one of the things I would say is I didn't talk about this yet, but is, you know, just like I recommend with fish and acquiring fish, if you're acquiring Acropora, um, 
you know, uh, or whatever. Know if you're quarantining, know what you're looking for in terms of dealing with pests. And that even goes to, you know, pest algaes, anything like that. Uh, because what I see a lot of people do is they get their tanks going, you know, it's designed well, all of this, and they just start throwing stuff in. And, you know, the, the amount of pests in our, I, I, it's probably gotten better because back in the day, you know, I remember we all went through the red bug thing, the yeah. acro eating flap, you know, they were in our tanks before we knew what the hell yeah. they were. Um, you know, so I would recommend um, that just whatever you're dealing with, know what parasites to look for and develop a method. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, what else? I mean, the um, I would say look to people, have mentors, okay, and sort of your, you know, people that can guide you along. Uh, you know, it used to be local people. It doesn't have to be now. You have your online communities. And listen to the people that you have respect for. You know, see that they can create a beautiful tank. See that they've been, you know, listen to people um, like that. Um, you know, I touched on it earlier, keeping your tank young, developing a perpetual system that is timeless, um, because a lot of people, they sort of, they set up their tank, they get SPS going and it, you know, and then they sort of go, Oh, look at this. That wasn't so hard. And then, you know, stuff starts tanking, you know, and all that. So sort of, uh, you know, whatever method you have, just be sure it's timeless. Another thing, disaster avoidance. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can create a system that, you know, Again, what kills most of our things is our own stupidity and improper planning. So set up for redundancy, set up for failure. If this pump fails, what happens? My electricity goes out, what happens? You know, if if your answer is, you know, I run around with my hands over my head and, you know, just run around the house screaming and start, you know, uh, planning for it when it happens, you know, that should not be the answer. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean... I don't know. Maybe they said three. I think that was four. How many generators do you have? Four. Yeah, I have redundancy. Yeah, so I have a, uh, a 17 and a half KW, a big boy. Um, and then again, you know, what happens if your generator doesn't work? Okay, I have a backup generator. Me too. Uh, I have a second. I have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two. And then, you know, I have a list of friends that, you know, a local group of friends that all have that, you know, I, and, you know, I run them regularly, all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah I have a, um, a full house backup generator, which actually the battery died on it earlier this week when it was running its uh, weekly test, it, it didn't crank over. I'm like, Ooh, okay. What's going on with that? I called the generator company and they're, yeah. you know, luckily we didn't have a power outage or what. And they came out a couple of days and they're like, well, yeah, the battery in the generator is dead. But I also have a portable generator just in case that uh, the main yes. uh, generator does not uh, go on. So I think that's that's a big, uh, certainly important point. And for me, even on a large system, I mean, you don't need that much of a generator to keep, you know, just your return yeah. pumps going. And it's a cloudy, you know, they don't need the lighting, it's cloudy days. And, and you know, a, a lot of, you know, the power grid I'm on has been really, really good, um, you know, so I'm not in Hurricane Alley or anything yeah. like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, listen, I'm going to let you go. Any uh, any final thoughts before we sign off tonight? No, just thanks for doing what you're doing. Hello to everybody. Um, have some patience. I'll update my threads. This has been a crazy year. Um, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Well, John, we'd, uh, I'd love to have you back on uh, next year possibly. And, and uh, I, know, I know you're a busy yeah. guy. And, and maybe, uh, maybe we could uh, see one another at, at MACNA in, in Milwaukee next year. I think I'm going to be there. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll Absolutely. be there. That will be a, that, that will be a well attended. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Yes. All yeah. right, folks. Well, that's going to do it for this show. I want to give my sincere thanks to uh, to John for being the uh, guest on today's live stream. My next live stream will be on Thursday, August twelfth at seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Jack Kent, who is the CEO of Brightwell Aquatics. So that should be another great show. Until then, be safe out there, and we will see you next time. Adios.